Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for asking me to speak. It is an honor for me to speak to all of you um, on this topic and to share my time with all of you Indian leaders. Um, you've asked me to talk about the issue of disenrollment, and my tribe has gotten a lot of attention because we were the first or one of the first to amend our constitution to ban disenrollment. Um, as I begin this talk, the first thing I want to say and make clear is that I honor the sovereignty, the absolute sovereignty of every nation to make decisions for and about itself. My opinions and what my tribe has done in no way are meant to be um, suggest laws or control or anything else for any other tribe. It's what we have done, and I can talk a little bit about the reasons that we have done this. Um, I have strong opinions about the matter, um, and, you know, would be happy if other tribes followed suit. But again, it is up to the tribes to decide what they want to do with their sovereignty. I would never recommend federal regulation of disenrollment or anything of that nature. Again, the sovereignty of each nation is supreme. Um, having said that, I want to give a little brief history about the reasons behind why Grayton did what Grayton did to amend its constitution. The history of uh, California Indians is, for the most part, somewhat particular or unique in this nation, particularly in the area where I am in North Central California. Here, as a consequence of the missions first and then the gold rush at the early American period, we suffered an incredible genocide. The missions took us in from, one mission would take us in from as far, say San Francisco or San, San Rafael, which is in our area. There were Indians that were moved there from other missions, other tribes, as far as 100 miles away. Two or three generations of people were born in those missions, dislocated from their original homes. And uh, when the missions were secularized in 1834, of course, those missionized Indians could not go back to their homes because they were not there. The villages were abandoned. And for often one, two, three generations, people had not lived there or knew how to live there anymore. North, in the north and north central, and, or north areas and northeastern areas of the state, followed with mass genocides by the early, early Americans. Um, again, leaving small numbers of survivors greatly dislocated. When the reservations were created, most of the reservations, not all of them, but many of the reservations known locally here as rancherias, um, were created in the early part of the 20th century. They were created for the quote-unquote homeless Indians of given areas. So in our area, for instance, uh, the Grayton Rancheria, which was only 15.5 acres, was created for the homeless Indians of, say, Tamales Bay, Bodega Bay, Sebastopol, and the vicinities thereof. That means in 18, or excuse me, 1923, any Indians who happened to be on the census in these areas became designees for these rancherias. Now, by that time, we'd been greatly displaced, and yes, many of us had ancestry back to Aboriginal villages here, but many of us on those original roles did not, or it could not be proved. Some were, some weren't. It didn't matter. Survivors ended up in a certain area. They married, and remember, the census that were taken from 1850 forward the census takers didn't go around and ask, are you originally from here? What's your ancestry? That sort of thing. They just took Indian. They put Indian down. And we were left the best way we could to take care of one another. So again, de facto nations were created here of groups of survivors. And certain of the languages in the areas, of course, survived. And unique and particular cultures also survived. But the mixture of people and people taken in as a consequence of that moving around was so fluid that it's very hard to say who was from where when by the time you get to 18, or excuse me, 1923, when in our case, our rancheria was created. This is a similar scenario throughout California. And people, of course, would move around and marry one another. The survivors on one rancheria were a very small group of people, maybe 100, maybe four, three, 
two or three hundred, but there wasn't much work in these remote areas, so people moved around, and whatever census were taken again, say in the 1930s, somebody might be working over here and end up on a census on a rancheria next door. So the question then always was, where we were all Indian people, all California Indian people here in this area, sharing a similar culture. And taking care of one another, for the most part, with what little we had. Well, then, of course, it became suddenly, and nobody was asking who's from where or shouldn't be here or this. None of those questions, as I remember growing up, hearing or people being preoccupied with. Suddenly, we get um, land and, and the issue of gaming and money. And suddenly, all of a sudden, all of us are saying, um, well, this person isn't really from here, and this person isn't really from there, and his f father was really from here and married somebody from in here, and all of a sudden we're starting to split hairs. And the problem here is that it becomes arbitrary. Depending on who has the most family members voting, you can decide anybody from one area, you can find a reason or an ancestor that would give you reason to disenroll these people. It's a question of power. And then, I would argue, greed. Now, the issue of greed um, is tied to something much more problematic here and ongoing. I just outlined for you a history of dislocation, of illegitimacy, of basically a kind of, uh, of the surviving a genocide. And what's become very sad among too many Indian people is that in various ways, as a result of this greed, as a result of suddenly being so concerned about who belongs where and all of this sort of thing, in, we have found yet a new way, a new way in place of alcohol or whatever you want to call it, of delegitimizing, destroying our own people of dislocating people, of not taking care of people, of repeating a history that was done to us so that we don't know any better and rely upon these often unconscious patterns to justify greed and everything else. You're really not from here. You're really not from there. The old time people never thought like that. What we are doing when we disenroll is ignoring the truths of our particular history here and at the same time, justifying actions that are predicated on behavior that is not our indigenous behavior, but something we inherited as a consequence of pain, suffering, which came from colonization that in so many ways destroyed us and left us with a few ancestors to take care of one another. And how sad that those ancestors' offspring are now repeating the actions that destroyed us in the first place. That is dislocating, making illegitimate, making no longer Indians, throwing people out. It's got to stop. So for us, as we saw this, it isn't only for us to not be swayed by greed, but to address something that has been inherent and done to us as a consequence of colonization, and that is the ways we hurt one another. So we thought, no, we must stop this. We must amend our constitution so that we forbid disenrollment. And this tribe went one step further when we made the compact with the governor for our casino and resort. Part of that compact, there's a, a part of the, a, a tenant of that compact is that for every person we disenroll, we have to pay the governor more money in our revenue share. Now, we don't disenroll, there's no problem. But again, what's interesting here is that where I would argue money's been the incentive to disenroll people, now Grayton has created an incentive that is legal and binding for 20 years with this compact to not disenroll people. Anybody can come along and amend a constitution. I could be thrown out after 13 consecutive terms or whatever, and this council could be thrown out, and we could have people come in and say, no, no, we're going to disenroll everybody, and, you know, Greg's family isn't from here, or this family isn't from there, and we're going to throw them all out. Sure, you can do that, but it's going to cost you a lot of money, particularly if you do it in the next 20 years. In the meantime, what we must do, all Indian people, is heal and acknowledge these things and not go crazy with the greed and the other kinds of unconscious 
ways in which we continue to finish the white man's work for him by destroying, delegitimizing, and dislocating each and every one of us. Thank you.